What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Mission Control, podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make a positive impact in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Google News Times Media. And I would love to bring on my friend Fritz with Justice Team Creative Dance again. This is the capper. This is the final interview of season three. Welcome uh, to the show, Fritz. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate uh, being on this platform with you today, man. Great. Well, as uh, I don't know if you see the others or how we always start is telling us what your mission, what's the mission of Justice Community Creation? Yeah, so I've lived in Lansing for 32 years now, and I turned 33 this year. And I've been a part of uh, a lot of different nonprofits in terms of just volunteer work. Um, Nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity, because I believed in the work that they were doing in the community. Um, and other nonprofits that just had a really good vision and mission. But this nonprofit that I help uh, to really bring into fruition, the Justice League of Greater Lansing, Michigan, is really where my heart sits. Uh, this nonprofit started about three years ago. And the, the notion of it is to try and build a reparations model uh, to help repair the breach of wealth inequities for African Americans that are living in the Greater Lansing region. And so it's about working with churches uh, and, and congreg- uh, congregants to help repair the breach of wealth inequities and in doing so from a faith based lens. So it's essentially building a reparations model through the church avenue. And uh, you said that this uh, organization started about three years ago. Yeah, well, talk to me about how you got here. How did you manage to be where you are? Yeah, so the, the organization is about three years old, but you know, the first to second year, it's about building the organization, right? and leveraging networks and resources. So the Justice League actually gained its 501c3 status uh, this past year. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, I have lived in the city my whole life. So I've seen uh, a lot of the great work that goes on in this community. And so I actually met the founder of this nonprofit. Her name is Willie Bryan at an event that was held at the Michigan Library. It was called the I-496 Pave the Way Project. And I'm sure you and a lot of your viewers have probably uh, learned a thing or two about the impact of the I-496 Pave the Way Project. You know, it looks at the devastation of how the development of the expressway essentially tore through Black neighborhoods, Black schools, Black churches, and how it uh, displaced the African-American community. And so I was very you know, interested in the development of this project. And that's where I met the founder of our organization, uh, Miss Willie Bryan. And so we connected there and we went about three years without speaking to each other and whatnot, but she called me randomly um, out the blue one day and said, hey, I'm working on this project. She shared the uh, basic foundation of the project. And I was like, that sounds like the type of work that I'm looking to really invest my time and my skill set into. And so I started volunteering uh, through the Justice League. And uh, three years later, here we are, man. Well, you know, the the mission, as you put it, at the top end of the show, may have some controversial aspects to it. Or, you know, or I shouldn't say, or it may be controversial, even though it really isn't. 
Um, what has been the reception, you know, putting this brand new nonprofit out there and, you know, getting people into your mission? Yeah, it's a really great question, Paul. So I will say that the the idea of reparations is this 400 year old concept that we're trying to breathe new life into right so we don't approach it as if it's something that's brand new instead what we do is we look at the facts of history we look at the facts of how many churches uh, have directly and indirectly benefited from slavery as other industries have within this country, right? I, I'm sure some of your viewers may have read how insurance companies or colleges and universities have benefited from the legacy of slavery and whatnot. And so uh, we approach it from an educational, informational standpoint. For many of the people who have witnessed our presentations, it's actually eye-opening. And we're talking people who range between their mid-20s to you know, <clears throat> late 70s, early 80s, but it's information that they simply weren't privy to within high school, college, or you know, a higher education. And so the way that we deliver it is another um, benefit where it's inviting people to understand the history of our country and then be able to um, ask questions, right? Um, many people are not just given the space to ask questions about the legacy of slavery and its aftermath simply because there's not space created within our classrooms or society for that matter, for us to like really dig deep into the facts and, and how we all um, are affected by that uh, today. So we've had a mix, you know, uh, bag of responses, but for the most part, uh, both community partners, uh, people who've lived in this community, the residents, as well as churches, have uh, been very supportive of the work that we're doing. And what we've realized throughout this process is that many churches have been doing the work. And by the work, I mean talking about racial justice, talking about social justice for decades. And many of these churches have found creative ways to support different movements or participate in community engagement. But I think what the Justice League uh, is, is offering is a blueprint to actually repairing the breach of wealth inequities. And so we kind of have served as a catalyst, if you will, within many churches to say, hey, if you're really about racial justice, social justice, and we want to make an impact based on the facts, then this is what the Justice League is doing. And this is how you can contribute to that. So um, it's it's amazing, uh, honestly, to, to get the type of response that we've been getting. But at its very core, it's education. Let's talk about some of these responses. Were you surprised um, at some of the positive reception right off the bat? Great question. Um, I'm very moved by the people who make up this organization and more specifically by its leadership, right? So the way that we move the pendulum at any level of uh, organizing is through cultivating relationships. So to see um, members from many of the churches in the greater Lansing region come to Justice League meetings, support Justice League in one form or another, inviting us in to help disseminate information um, has been a real tool to help us get word out um, and to get uh, to get more traction. So um, I'm just proud of the team. I'm, I'm proud of the intergenerational work that's taken place here. 
you know, I think us young folks will try to write off sometimes the elder generation, but in reality, they have the keys, right? They have the keys, they have the wisdom, they have the access, they have the professional experience, they have the patience, and sometimes they just need uh, the quote, quote, younger generation to work with them to get to that next step. And I think that's what has been so successful about what we're doing. It's literally uh, both the young as well as the elders coming together to move in a direction. Now, talk to me a little bit about um, all the things that uh, Justice League puts out there. I mean, I know that we've been talking about, you know, uh, the reparations and, um, you know, uh, and the discussion around that. What are what are the the ways that you're getting that message out there? And what are I mean, are there uh, seminars? Are there um, you know events? What what are some of the things that you're doing to to like embrace the community by because obviously you're not staying within your four walls and just you know just spouting you know um information that people can right. probably clean off the internet you're actually going out into the community and doing uh the work what does that look like yeah so i always uh say to the founder, Willie Bryan, that if she takes the sky, I'll take the ground. And I think that's that that metaphor, you know, speaks to her level of experience and wisdom of being a Presbyterian uh, here at Lansing First Press for the past 22 years. And it also speaks to my experience of living in this city for the past 32 years. And so uh, we leverage our networks in order to get this message out, right? So it really does feel like we're living out this mission. So because by nature, I'm somebody who enjoys group dynamics, my background is in professional communications. And so, you know, I tend to look at the world through this lens of uh, the teacher and the student and reverse roles where the teacher can be the student and the student can be the teacher. And so we've done a really great job at leveraging our networks. So uh, what we've done is we've communicated to officials within the Presbyterian church. We've kept our executive presbyter, uh, Fran Lawrence, uh, who oversees you know, a number of churches within the state of Michigan, we've kept them informed about the work that we're doing here at the grassroots level. Um, I've contacted employee resource groups from Michigan State University Federal Credit Union that I was a part of several years ago. And I just said, hey, this is work that I've been doing and I want to keep you abreast. Um, we've looked at our uh, social networks from fraternities and sororities to reach out to them, to educate them about the work that we're doing. Um, we've leveraged networks, of course, within the church. Um, and so that's led to us being invited to Chicago this past summer to be a part of a reparations um, discussion with other leaders within the country who are all working toward a notion of reparations. And then uh, this past summer, we also visited Washington DC to do a presentation for the National, Councils, uh, the National Council of Churches, which is the largest interfaith group of churches in the, in the country, about 38 uh, uh, groups. So uh, it's lots and lots of presentations. <laughs> it's lots and lots of hearing people's um, understanding of history. And then we talk about how do we get to that next level? Uh, so to, just to kind of summarize, it's been a matter of leveraging our networks and trying to live into what it is 
that we're trying to uh, practice. Um, and a case in point of that is uh, the apology, right? And uh, you had the opportunity to actually work with the Justice League and uh, uh, being able to just kind of capture the apology. So this apology, its, it's, it's official name is called the Litany of Repentance. And the Litany of Repentance acknowledges uh, the legacy of slavery. And it talks about it very vividly about white Christians being complicit due to the torture, suppressing black agency, uh, you know, uh, just ignoring, right? I ignoring the brutality in which African-Americans have uh, suffered and the descendants of enslaved African-Americans have suffered while white Christians were able to benefit either through housing policies or through um, uh, just different resources that this country offered. So the apology was offered on January 28th this year on the south side of Lansing uh, at um, Lansing Reach Out Christian Center. Uh, it's pastored by David Foreman. And we had roughly uh, 160, 170 people there. Um, many of them were uh, clergy who offered the apology to a predominantly um, uh, black audience, people from that community. And that was the starting point. You know, uh, that apology was issued by the 225th General Assembly for PCUSA, which stands for Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, so the apology was written and the Justice League felt like, hey, we want to take that document and actually live into it and put it on the ground level. So we've offered that apology now uh, on three different occasions, most recently at the state capitol on Juneteenth. And uh, we invited out the community um, again to acknowledge the legacy of slavery. And what many people don't realize is that there's never been a formal acknowledgement for the legacy of slavery. So starting there, right, that that's that can be the beginning of the healing process. And then we get into the proactive state, actionable items. And that's where the Justice League comes in. Uh, so the acknowledgement of the apology and then the steps we can do to actually help to repair the breach. So that's what it's been looking like, you know, at, at the grassroots level education, information, and connecting with the people. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, since you brought it up, yes, I was at that event on in January, and it was very powerful, very moving. Um, how, what was your mindset during that, when that was happening? I know, because it is a culmination of a lot of work, yeah, of a lot of communication, a lot of uh, collaboration. Um, how, how did you feel about that kind of like key kickoff to what you've been working towards? Yeah. You know, my personality is to always make sure that people around me feel comfortable. And so I can kind of sense when people are nervous or, you know, out of balance or something like that. So that uh, that encourages me to keep my cool. So the day of, you know, I'm keeping it cool. Um, but I was very moved to be a part of that. You know, I can't express in words how much it meant for me to be a part of something that was that uh, intricate in the city in which I'm from. Uh, so I was proud of the uh, pastors that got from beyond the desk to come out and support. I was proud to have my mom there, my twin brother there, my aunt there, some friends there. And then, you know, members of the um, African-American community who I never met before also show up uh, because they have also been uh, staying abreast of the work that we've been doing. So it was a very moving day. Um, I always play the role of a, a support system. You know, that's what I'm good at. Um, if I were to, uh, you know, describe myself in most settings, it's kind of like trying to be the foundation of things. 
uh, to be of support. So that day in particular, I just wanted to make sure that everyone felt supported. Uh, everything felt like there was a good flow in that we felt open enough uh, to talk you know, vulnerably about this very sensitive subject, uh, the legacy of slavery and its aftermath. But um, I was very proud of the work that we had did that day. And what kind of uh, feedback did you receive from the folks that were there? Yeah, I think the um, the response has been authentic. You know, I can say that much. It's been authentic from both the church and the unchurch. You know, and that's so important for our community to understand that this notion of reparations or the vision that the Justice League is looking to implement, it's starting as a faith-based model out of the church. However, it is designed to be encompassing of the descendants of enslaved African Americans, that's church and unchurch. And so to be in that room that day, just with community, with elders, I mean, people who I saw doing the work when I was, you know, uh, second or third grade, to have them there, uh, the Dr. Lee Taylors, uh, the Dr. Jeffrey Langs uh, of the city, um, you know, to see these elders in the room and to have them receive the apology, uh, it made me, you know, very sensitive. You know, especially when when you when your mom cries, you cry, right? So. Um, the response was authentic, man, 100%. I don't doubt it. It was an incredible uh, time, but I want to also look into a little bit about, you mentioned foundation and, mm. and uh, how that establishes where um, this program is, is going and where it's been. But what about Prince's Foundations? Now, I know that you've been a part of Justice League for three years. However, you know, it's in its infancy or toddlerhood, however you want to put it, sure. as an organization. Right. Um, but so you have to, like, fund yourself in some way, shape or form. And you are part of the Presbyterian Church here. In right. Nancy. So talk to me a little bit about um, how that how how that. Uh, your day to day, what you what do you do day to day, and how does that feed into what you're doing with Justice League? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question, Paul. I um, I'm a very introverted person, so I spend a great deal of my time by myself, and so um, I, I I plan a lot, and I try to establish really good communication. I'm not the the wittiest person in the room. I'm the person who, if you have a witty idea, I'm going to try to ground it as much as possible so that we can actually implement it. And so, you know, what my day-to-day -day looks like is, um, I, I will say in this context, or, or rather this chapter in my life, because the 33-year-old me is a lot different than um, the 30-year-old me versus the 25-year-old me, right? just progress and maturity. Uh, but now I can, uh, I can make light of the work by realizing that it's not about me. And I think that mentality has shifted um, between my late twenties and where I am today. You know, if it's focused on me, then I'm having to think or overcalculate everything that I'm doing. But when I think about just being a part of a team and making a vision come true, it keeps me up at all odd hours of the night. Uh, it keeps me writing. It keeps me thinking. It keeps the brain flowing. So I, um, right now I'm in this stage of life where I'm just witnessing the work. I try to pull myself back from it as much as possible and still realize, you know, I'm this you know, nerdy kid inside who still like watching nature documentaries and would prefer to be, you know, introverted and reading my book and away from the world. And yet I have this responsibility to um, 
participate and contribute to a project that's bigger than myself. So that gets me up and that gets me going. And speaking of which, um, just another segue to things that Prince is doing in his life. You're also a very uh, big part of, or you've involved yourself in a big way with the Mandela Scholarship at MSU. So talk a, a little bit about that and how that program has intersected in the work that you're doing. Yeah, you know, that my my outlook on life really starts from I think the second or third grade. You know those posters that would be in your classroom when you were a kid? Uh, there's one particular poster that always stood out to me. And it was the one of like the world. And it had like a bunch of kids from different races and different ethnicities uh, holding hands around the world. And as cheesy as that is, that image has always stuck with me. And so it's, it's an ideal image, but I've always been able to find a way to bridge my work to that concept. So my outlook on life is like, how can I find ways to bridge people? How can I bridge myself to something I've never tried before? And excuse me, I, um, I came across the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program after my trip to Israel. I had met with the director of global studies. His name is Dr. Salah Hassan. And I was just talking to him, you know, informally about my trip and, and what it meant to me. And he said, I think you'd be a good fit for this, uh, this fellowship program. Uh, what this program is, it's uh, 16, excuse me, 25 fellows visiting from 16 different countries in Africa. So from Senegal, the Gambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, Djibouti, and so on and so forth. And so these fellows are not students, but fellows, meaning they're knee deep in their profession as much as I am. So really my peers. And I, um, I just thought it would be a great opportunity for me to welcome them to, to my city, right? So that's how I looked at it. Like if, if, these, if these people are coming over here for the first time, um, I would want to make them feel as welcome and, uh, and, and, and connect them to community partners that really reflected what um, you know, th their focus was. So I did that for the first time this year. They were here for six weeks. Um, I shared uh, shared them with different community partners. We traveled to Detroit, checked out the Charles Wright Museum. Um, of course, there was this really deep cultural exchange uh, that connected us all. Uh, some of the community partners I connected them to are uh, Todd Martin Youth Leadership which is interesting because I think there was just a uh, uh, news blast that went out by uh, your organization that is talking about Todd Martin or doing an interview with Rebecca from there. Uh, so we worked with uh, Todd Martin Youth Leadership. We partnered with uh, Peckham as well. Um, we partnered with uh, the Firecracker Foundation. Um, Tajmika Torak did healing, opening and closing healing circles for the fellows, um, which was beautiful because what we tend to forget is like these fellows are coming over together, but it's their first time meeting each other as well, right? So they're meeting for the first time. They're being introduced to American culture for the first time. It's their first time meeting me. And so to find a way to bring us together and to be vulnerable uh, was very beautiful. So hats off to Tajmika and just the work that she does. It was uh, absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, the, the Mandela Fellowship Program has a deep uh, place in my heart. I'll be participating in a reciprocal exchange uh, next summer where I will be going to the Gambia to talk about um, reparations and what that looks like at the grassroots level here 
and the um, fellow from the Gambia will be partnering with me on that. So, you know, we, we're keeping these relationships uh, alive. So it's pretty cool. That's great. I mean, and this is uh, the last question. This is how I usually cap it off. Okay. You know, we've been talking about a lot of the things that you're doing out in the community, um, how you're grounded in it, and what moves you in those circles. But the question I have for you is, how do you, how do you escape? How do you kind of break off and, you know, just try to channel yourself in, in areas that uh, allow you to relax a little bit, to get away? What are, what, what, what's the other side that like, makes Prince tick? Yeah. It's gonna sound boring, man. <laughs> you know, hey, if, if, if it gets you to relax, it's not boring. Yeah, well, it's it's a culmination of things. You know, I'm a I'm a slow mover. <clears throat> I'm a slow thinker as well, and so uh, I plot quite a bit. And so, uh, reading helps me escape. Um, I've been reading uh, Children of Blood and Bones. It's my first sci-fi book that I've ever uh, read. It's written by a Nigerian author. Uh, and to have a, because I normally read like autobiographies and things like that, right? So um, to add a little bit of fantasy and a little bit of sci-fi to my reading uh, actually opened my senses up to something different. Uh, I'm also reading a book, the autobiography of Al Malcolm X right now for the second time. Um, I'm also listening to an audible book called The Alchemist. Uh, so I like to listen to audibles and, and read um, and, and, and travel. Travel helps me um, empathize with humanity. So I'll be going to uh, Japan this fall. And then if all works out, I'll be going to the Gambia in uh, uh, either the spring of 2024. So, so traveling helps me relax a little bit, observe the world, observe culture, appreciate culture, um, engage with culture. And, uh, you know, when you travel, it makes the world just a little bit smaller. And it makes you look at your community a little bit different, too, you know, so... Yeah, those are a couple of the things I like to do, man. And, and running. I'm actually preparing for a, a marathon this fall. So running is like the uh, the undercurrent to my life. There's a great running group here in Lansing called 517 Run the City. It's led by uh, Ramon. It's a young uh, professionals group. Uh, we get together on Tuesdays and Saturdays um, and we run and we talk and we bond. So yeah great so how do people get get in touch with you or or learn more about justice league and the stuff that you're involved with what's the best way for those those folks to get 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 a get in touch with you about that yeah so the greatest way to get in contact with me would be to uh send an email um you can send an email to justice league glm at gmail.com if you would like to attend a monthly team meeting, which I would highly recommend, uh, we meet on the second Tuesday of each month. And so I believe the next meeting coming up is going to be September 12th. And it's from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, we are meeting right now via Zoom. And <clears throat> at that monthly team meeting, we simply go over the progress of where we're at, um, we do a committee report out uh, as to what our PR team, our resource development team, our finance team are working on. Um, and then we just do a, a meet and greet. So I would love to have you come and just be a fly on the wall um, just to start. So Awesome. Thank you very much for your time and being on the program and being our, our last interview for season three. Really appreciate it, friends. Yeah, Paul, thanks for the opportunity and thank you for all the great work that you've been doing. And I'm just going to give a small shout out to uh, CISO. Uh, give a small shout out to CISO because CISO is the way that uh, we connected, but mm -hmm. he's also a, uh, an instrument in this city and he connects so many different people in direct and indirect ways. And so it's nice meeting you 
and knowing the work that you do with uh, different nonprofits and you really helped uh, support the Justice League just through your work. So thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you all in the audience for taking some time to listen to this program. This is the final episode of season three. So don't miss next season as it comes up in uh, 2024, but also catch up on the rest of the episodes that were uh, launched through 2023. And if there is somebody that you know of that you would like to hear about on their journey, uh, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time in the Control Center. And that's it.